and in oh, recording in progress. <laughs> um, in the interest of trying to stick to to time, we'll we'll get started. And just so everyone is aware, we're in the LGBTQ plus older adults and care home residents breakout room. If you're in the right space, hopefully that's okay for you. Good. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today. My name is Bryony Porter. I'm a senior research associate at the University of East Anglia, and I'm one of the PLUS project uh, principal investigators, and I'm talking later on this afternoon. Um, what we'll be doing today, so our presenters have 10 minutes each. I'll give you all a two minute warning. I'll you know, unmute myself and just say two minutes. Hopefully that won't put you off too much um, before. The idea is that, that everyone will present and then we'll have time for discussion at the end. But in the interim, you can add your questions and comments into the chat and then the speakers can uh, feedback on those as well as we go through. OK, so I think just check if that was everything I was supposed to tell you. Looks like it. Um, you'll all be pleased to know the session after this is lunch as well, which is always nice to know that's something to look forward to. Um, okay, so up first, we've got Gemma Lewis joining us if you want to start sharing your slides. And Gemma will be talking about a project titled Investigating Whether Loneliness is a Mechanism that Leads to Depressive Symptoms in Older Adults Who Are Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, or Have Chronic Physical Health Problems. Okay. Over Thank to you, you. Brian. Thank you, Brian. Sorry. Um, is that, does that look okay for everyone? Brilliant. All right. Stop my clock. Yeah. So I'm going to be talking today about loneliness as a mechanism underlying depressive symptoms in older adults who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or older adults who have chronic physical health problems. I just wanted to mention my collaborators. So um, PhD researcher working with me, Talon Wright, led study one. A PhD researcher called uh, Aaron Canzola led study two, and then we've also got uh, other collaborators who have worked across both studies with us. So just to uh, briefly go through the background, there's uh, well-established evidence that certain groups of older adults are at higher risk of depression compared with the rest of the general population, and, and these include adults, uh, older adults who are LGBTQ+, and also older adults who have chronic physical health problems. So really strong evidence and well-established risk, uh, well-established evidence that uh, both of these groups are at increased risk of depression. However, although these exposures are common among older adults, we do have a poor understanding of the mechanisms that lead to the higher risk of depression that we consistently observe in these groups. So there are various sort of theoretical reasons to believe that loneliness might be higher in uh, LGBTQ plus older adults and also in adults with chronic, with chronic physical health problems, and that this increased level of loneliness might explain an increased risk of subsequent depressive symptoms. However, there are very few studies which had tested this hypothesis at the time that we applied for the um, Pathways Grant and, and still now. So we thought this was important because, you know, as we've as we've been discussing throughout the session today, interventions which address loneliness could improve depressive symptoms, and and these interventions could be could be tailored towards certain high risk groups if there was stronger evidence that these associations were causal. So we did two studies as part of our project. The first one asked whether LGB older adults were at increased risk of future loneliness compared with heterosexuals. And then after addressing this question, we looked at the extent to which loneliness might explain the increased risk of depressive symptoms among LGB compared with heterosexual older adults. And then we did study two as a separate uh, project, and we looked at the same research questions, but for the other high risk groups. So we asked whether older adults with chronic physical health conditions were at increased risk of future loneliness compared to adults without such physical health problems. And we then examined the extent to which loneliness might explain the increased risk of future depressive symptoms among adults with physical, physical health problems compared to those without. So I'll just go through the methods briefly and then the results and implications for each of these two studies separately. Before we launch into that, I just wanted to show this um, perhaps quite complex looking figure, but basically for those more interested, in the methods, uh, this illustrates the mediation model, which we tested. So basically it separates itself into 
the exposure variable, which is shown here for study one, um, we look at whether that exposure variable has an effect on the on the outcome later, which is depressive symptoms, which we know is well established. And the more novel bits were the investigation of whether the exposure is associated with the mediator and the extent to which the mediator might explain the association we know already exists between um, sexual orientation and depressive symptoms or physical health problems and, and depressive symptoms. And we've uh, labeled these pathways path A, exposure to mediator, uh, path B, exposure to outcome, and path C, mediator to outcome. And we used various methods which allowed us to adjust for intermediate confounders and confounders that were classified as being unique to each of these mediation pathways. So we use the English Longitudinal uh, Study of Aging, which is an ongoing nationally representative cohort study of the English population over the age of 50. The original sampling was done in 2002, where over 11,000 adults over the age of 50 were retained. And this is a really, really rich data set, which has followed participants up every two years. And I think this needs to be updated now. There were nine assessments up to 2018-19, but this is ongoing. And there have been um, these really nice regular regular assessments every two years since 2002. So this allowed us access to a really, really rich set of longitudinal data to uh, test these hypotheses with, with a good level of temporality between the exposures, mediators and outcomes. So for study one, so I'll just comment on, on the variables. So sexual orientation was first measured at wave six in 2012-2013, so it took a while for um, for this to actually be measured, and it was first available wave six, 2012-2013. Now, it was based on an assessment of sexual experiences and sexual attraction. We unfortunately had to make this binary because of small categories in individual groups, and this led to a binary um, lesbian, gay, bisexual compared with heterosexual category. I wanted to comment on the fact that, unfortunately, uh, gender gender identity and gender experiences were not collected within the data set, so we were unable to, were unable to um, identify or include trans individuals in this study. So hence the, the focus just on the LGB. But that is a future direction for our important research. We measured loneliness using uh, three items on the UCLA scale, which has been mentioned throughout the session today. And, and this was also measured at, at wave six because we considered reverse causation between exposure and mediator to be implausible in this instance. And we had symptoms of depression measured with the CESD, which is a scale often used for older adults at wave seven, which was two years later in 2014. So confounders common to all pathways were age, sex, education, and ethnicity. We also adjusted path C for um, various variables which may be associated with exposure and outcome. And we also included intermediate confounders. And I won't go into that in too much detail now because it's methodological, but you know, very happy to answer any questions about that. We also adjusted for polygenic risk scores for depression and loneliness, because we did that in the previous paper and there's evidence of you know, potential genetic overlap between, between those two constructs. So what we found, so we ended up with data from just over 6,700 participants. We found evidence that LGB older adults had higher levels of loneliness compared with heterosexuals, and this was a mean difference of 0.18 points, uh, points on the loneliness scale. We also found evidence of what we expected to find, which was that LGB older adults scored higher on depressive symptoms two years later, with a mean difference of 0.26 on the depressive symptoms scale. And interestingly, there was evidence of an indirect effect, which is a another term for, for a mediation effect. So uh, this indirect effect went from sexual minority status to depressive symptoms through the hypothesized mediator, data, which was loneliness. So um, this equated to 15% of the total effect of sexual orientation on depressive symptoms, potentially being attributed to loneliness if these associations were causal. So in terms of study two, we looked at chronic physical health problems, so ones that we selected based on them based on them already. Yeah, thank you, Brainy. Based on them already having a well-established association with depressive symptoms. Uh, loneliness two years after physical health problems with the same scale, 
and depressive symptoms two years after loneliness with the same scale. We made the binary measure of physical health problems again because of relatively small numbers in some of the subgroups. And then a similar approach to confounders. So we adjusted separately for each, each arm of the mediation model. And um, these included a wide range of, of confounders because unlike the LGB investigation, uh, uh, this, this set of, of variables was, was sort of much, much more susceptible to, to confounding and we included the polygenic risk scores there. So we had data from over 9,000 participants. We found that chronic physical illness was associated with a 21% increase in depressive symptoms. However, different pattern here, we found no evidence of an association between chronic physical illness and subsequent loneliness. So that was somewhat surprising. And because we found, we didn't find evidence of that pathway, we did not progress to exploring any, any mediation models because um, that, that didn't seem theoretically plausible um, given the lack of evidence of an effect of the exposure on the mediator, which was loneliness. So in terms of implications, the increased risk of depression in LGB compared with heterosexual older adults could be due in part to higher levels of loneliness. And this would suggest that community interventions that create safe inclusive spaces to build meaningful connections could reduce loneliness and prevent depression in this group. However, chronic physical illnesses increase the risk of depressive symptoms. This seems unlikely to occur through increased loneliness based on our findings. So reducing loneliness among people with chronic or physical illnesses seems unlikely to prevent future depression, unlike what we found with, with the LGB or the adults. Okay, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Gemma, and perfectly to time. Fantastic. Really wonderful presentation. If you could add your questions into the chat for Gemma, and we'll move straight on to, um, to the next presentation, which is from Zoe. Zoe Bowden, whose presentation is about pathways between LGBTQ migration, social isolation, and mental distress, the temporal, relational, spatial experiences of LGBTQ mental health service users. You'd like to go. Ugh, slides are being shared already. Fantastic. Okay. I'll um, start my timer for you, Zoe, and I'll give you a two minute heads up as well. Okay. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, my talk's called Loneliness and Distress in the European Capital of Gayness, which was a quote from one of our participants. And it's about the relationship between uh, LGBTQ migration, which is um, we were looking at both um, people who were coming to Brighton, the supposed European Capital of Gayness. Um, from within the UK and also from overseas. And of course, there's social isolation and, and distress. And it was a collaboration between myself. Um, I am a psychologist and psychotherapist, Nick McGlynn, who's a geographer, and Helen Jones, who's the CEO of Mind Out, which is a specialist LGBTQ mental health provider in Brighton, and our research officer, Matt. I'm only able to really show you um, some findings here because we're still in the final stages because my wife and I had a baby last year and I'm currently on shared parental leave. So we're on pause with this project. Oh, it's not letting me change the slide. Why is it not letting me change the slide? Don't know. There we go. Okay. So why would we do this research? So there's three reasons. Um, firstly, well, I'm going to give you just three reasons. Firstly, that social isolation and loneliness are really important issues for some within the LGBTQ communities, particularly those who are experiencing challenges with their mental health. Um, which is what Catherine Johnson calls the double stigma. So the stigma of a sexual orientation that's non-normative or gender diversity, as well as experiencing psychological distress. We chose Brighton because it's seen as the gay capital of the UK. And it's important for us to understand the experience of LGBTQ newcomers to cities like this. And thirdly, we know that many people are migrating, many uh, queer people are migrating to Brighton um, from elsewhere in the UK and abroad. But there isn't surprisingly good evidence about uh, what that experience is like and how it relates to uh, their relational lives and their mental health. So as I said, this was a collaboration with Mind Out and we worked with um, service users within the group as well as an academic um, uh, advisory group. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we did. So this was a qualitative piece of research. We interviewed 16 people, most of them twice. So we had 30 interviews in total. Um, <clears throat> and we did a visual and um, verbal form of data collection. So we interviewed everybody and we asked them to do drawings 
or annotate a geographical map um, in their interviews. So the first interview focused on the journey to Brighton and the second on their experiences since they'd arrived in Brighton. And I'm gonna share some quotes with you and all the names here are pseudonyms. So as I said, this is somewhat draft findings and these are the findings from our community report, which we've written um, with Mind Out in mind. Um, we've got four themes, queer quests, pathways to Brighton, an LGBTQ city, find my community, finding myself, cheated expectations and an epilogue. And I'm just gonna pull out um, a few themes because of the nature of our data collection being both verbal in terms of the interview and visual in terms of the drawings and annotated maps. There was a lot of data, so it turned out to be quite an ambitious project in the end. So here's the first theme. And we looked at people's journeys to Brighton from a narrative perspective as a quest away from loneliness, oppression and abuse or violence and towards freedom, safety, support and community. And this is an image, all the images you're gonna see are, are from the study. And this is an image from Rita who sort of exemplifies that kind of sunshine and happiness that she was hoping to find here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so in um, all of our participants' backgrounds, there was isolation, there was trauma, and there were complex mental health needs, um, which were often unmet. And the first sub-theme shows how loneliness was a big part of many of our participants' lives for a long time. So this quote's from Edward. He is a young transmasculine person, and he's talking about where he grew up um, in the north of England. And he said, it was very lonely. I didn't really know anyone else. It's quite a conservative kind of place. Being trans doesn't really get talked about. So it's quite isolating to not have anyone else there that feels the same way as you do. Many of our other participants described a sense of feeling dislocated from family and community, trans people, people who are neurodiverse and older uh, uh, LGBTQ people in particular described extreme loneliness and isolation in their past. Brighton was often seen as a way to escape these feelings of loneliness, oppression, and distress. Lake, who was a young trans and non-binary person, exemplifies the romanticization and idealization of Brighton as a queer paradise where they would feel welcomed and part of the community at last. So they talk about you know, idealizing it as a way to get out and make friends. And Joni, who's an older lesbian, had felt very oppressed where she had lived previously. And you can see that um, just about in this drawing um, that she talks about being trapped and afraid. She describes feeling unsafe and isolated in her previous home. And she tried for two years to move to Brighton because she lived in council accommodation and wasn't able to afford rent privately um, because of her health needs. What I think is quite interesting is that we found that many people in our sample chose to come to Brighton specifically because of the care and services that were available that were um, specialist services for LGBTQ people. This included care in older age, uh, gender identity services, LGBTQ friendly GPs and specialist mental health services like Mind Out. Sai, who was a gay man in middle age, showed how this changed for him. So he came to Brighton once when he was younger to live for a while, then moved away and then came back. So he talks about when he first came, uh, wanting to go to the Camelford, which is a, um, a famous gay pub in um, Kemp Town, and be gay out in the street and go to Pride. But actually when he came back, uh, the top of the list he says was mental health services and he'd had breakdowns elsewhere. He says the care was just disgusting. Um, it's partly why I had a breakdown because it's a totally different world up there. So our third theme this, um, explores the social and emotional environment and atmosphere people described when they told us that they came to Brighton. And um, the quote here is, find my community, find myself, comes from Lucia's image of her journey to Brighton. Lots of our participants talked about freedom as being a key aspect of their experience in Brighton. So Rita was an older lesbian who had only moved to Brighton in her 70s, having been able to access supported accommodation, which had allowed her to come. Um, she describes feeling liberated both as a woman and as a lesbian and links this with her self-confidence and her capacity to connect with other people. In the second quote, Edward, the young trans person, talks about this more explicitly, how Brighton has given him confidence to be himself. People also spoke about Brighton as a healing place. 
the seafront and the green spaces like the parks and gardens were particularly important and you can see how people have illustrated those in their maps just there. They talked about places being calming, healing, therapeutic. So these everyday activities like going for a walk along the sea were associated with people's well-being. Um, and solitude as well as connection was important here. Um, and Leela talks about having a bad day and being able to go and sit on the beach. Um, they said it's real good for my mental health. Despite many people finding Brighton to be a space where they could be more themselves and feeling safe and accepted, this is still relative. Whilst Bill talks about feeling lucky for living in a safer place than where he'd experienced really awful homophobic violence and bullying, Joni recognizes that Brighton still, um, there's still um, prejudice and homophobia in Brighton. It's not a utopia for gay people. Thank you. So this is our last theme, tutored expectations. Many talked about the disappointment that they felt when they got to Brighton and it didn't live up to what they had hoped for. They felt they didn't fit in with the LGBTQ or trans, uh, or yeah, um, LGBTQ communities, individual communities. And Sai was somebody who really explained this very clearly. Previously, he'd been talking on apps to people. And when he got there, he said, oh, it's not all glitter. It's not all rainbows. Some of it's pretty bitchy and cliquey. And he talks about how he shared his mental health experiences and felt that that um, became a barrier to him making friends. Having moved to Brighton with the hope of fitting in and finding that they still were lonely was hugely disappointing for some people. Um, so Terry talks here about um, having been here for 20 years and yet still not feeling that she'd found people. So it must be something about her. And of course, loneliness was exacerbated by the pandemic. So Harley talks about um, it being like an amusement park with all the rides being closed. Leela talks about how um, she felt completely connected, but also the most isolated because she couldn't access the support groups that were around. And Al, who is an older genderqueer person, talked about retreating into themselves and becoming so isolated that they made a further attempt on their life. I'm just gonna skip on um, because I wanna finish. LGBTQ life. Um, because of where we are in the research, I can't give you a clear set of conclusions yet, but I can say that mental health status is a significant barrier to LGBTQ migrants feeling included in LGBTQ life in the gay capital of the UK, and that this is particularly pressing for trans people of all ages, those who are neurodiverse, and for older gay and lesbian people. Sai sums it up well when he describes how his mental health problems have travelled with him to Brighton. It doesn't matter where you move if you've still got the same luggage inside you. But our other really important finding was that um, the services that Brighton offers and other um, LGBT friendly cities offer uh, are particularly important for people and Mind Out in particular was praised for literally saving people's lives. And that's the end. Thank you. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Zoe. What an insightful piece of work into sort of the good and the challenges of, of Brighton and that a real example of sort of when you're you can feel lonely even though you're in amongst a community of people right i know yeah. you've got to head off zoe um so but so zoe's got to head off so if you could pop your email in the chat if people do have specific questions with zoe to talk about the project and they want to find out more then please do contact her and um, thank you so much for being with us today thank you for for having me yeah right so over to our next center Tara Keck, who's talking about risk factors for loneliness in older populations in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. Um, got your slides okay, Tara? Yep, I can see those fine. Excellent. I'll, I'll give you the two minute heads up, okay? That's perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, so I'm really excited to talk here today. I'm a professor of neuroscience based in the Division of Biosciences, and I'm actually really excited because this is, I normally am working on healthy aging and how it is that our brains change throughout our lifetimes, particularly into aging, and so this is the first fully loneliness conference that I've attended, um, so I'm really excited to, to hear, to be able to talk about our work here. Um, and so I've been working over the past years um, with the United Nations uh, population fund in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, looking at risk factors for loneliness um, in older people and um, how that affects demographics. So 
in there. Okay, so when we first start thinking about loneliness, um, obviously in giving my first talk to a loneliness group, this is um, sort of a, a generalization. Um, but when we think about this, particularly with older people, when we talk to people, they think about the first thing they think about is losing a spouse, being a widower or a widower. Um, and somebody living alone. And so I think that, again, we talked a little bit earlier about social isolation and loneliness um, and, and how those are interacting. Um, and when we start thinking about this from the perspective of um, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, we, are, we also have this idea of not ha having family with um, nearby. Um, and in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the aging population is already over 20% um, and is expected to hit nearly 40 in the next 20 years. And that has to do with both low birth rates and migration. So you have young people who don't have job opportunities moving to Western Europe. So you have these societies where lots of old people are on their own. Um, and then we also think about people not having social interactions or strong relationships. And so this project, um, sorry that this is common among older people. Um, and so this project really started um, when we were thinking about um, the older populations in, in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, where they've set up a lot of different aspects um, to try and support older people. And one of those things is um, a, a set of healthy aging centers where older people can come and spend the day. And so we started with this um, uh, 2019, just before COVID hit, looking at what older people who were socially engaged were um, feeling. And so we did a survey. This was based on the UK Biobank survey. Um, and we looked and people here reported high levels of family satisfaction. So this is extreme satisfaction, 58%. Friendship satisfaction, extreme satisfaction, 59%. And when we asked them, do you feel lonely? 75% of people who ex express having these great relationships said yes. And so this was something that was surprising to us at the time. Um, if people are happy with their relationships, why are they lonely? And so this is what started this project. Um, and you know, why are people lonely? And, and as I said, we think about these emotional aspects of loneliness, but there's a lot of different um, things that are contributing to it. Um, in addition to emotional support and belonging, which has been discussed at length, there's other factors. And so um, lack of social support and opportunities. So there are many older people who would express that they don't have some place to go or meet up. That was obviously not the case with our cohort who have these centers. Um, lacking social confidence or what's often referred to as maladaptive cognition, um, where people are nervous about, um, about interacting with other people, which was alluded to in some of the talks earlier this morning. Um, and finally, and what we're really going to focus on today is a lack of tangible support. So do people have somebody to help them if they need to have help with their groceries, if they need help cleaning up their house, if they need help going to the doctor, picking up prescriptions? So these are really day to day life tasks. Do they have these? And what's important about these is all of these are associated in the literature with loneliness, but they would all require pretty different interventions. And so we talked about not having great evidence for interventions earlier. And you know, if somebody's lacking tangible support and you try and give them um, an increase in social support, that may or may not actually address the issue at hand. And so in order to understand um, what the appropriate interventions would be for this population in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, we needed to identify the appropriate risk factors. So we were, did a survey. Um, we developed a questionnaire to quantify loneliness, relevant factors, and demographics. And what we did is we actually had both a loneliness survey as well as all of these potential risk factors that we could find in the literature to see what was relevant. And that also allowed us to make relative comparisons in the population in terms of what people were experiencing and which were the most relevant factors relative to one another. We implemented this survey in six countries and, um, and territories, Albania, Azerbaijan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Georgia, Serbia, and Kosovo. Um, and this was done with the support of the regional office of the UNFPA. And this allowed for demographic characterization and the developments um, in the long term of targeted approaches to reduce loneliness. And what's also interesting is because we're working in Eastern Europe, we have um, many cultural similarities across these countries, particularly the former Yugoslavian countries, um, where, but we have different governmental implementations. So that allows us to actually start to think about um, what, how it is that people are responding given that a lot of language and culture is shared. So it's a really interesting population. So as a brief um, overview, I'm just going to take you through the, the main results. We found that similar to what we saw in the Bosnia and Herzegovina study, 79% of our respondents were at least moderately lonely using an 11 item scale. Um, we went for a broader scale in order to actually be able to differentiate this and make um, better predictions with the risk factors. And within that 79%, 18% were severely lonely. 
Um, this is similar to what's been reported across this region. As I said, that th this is a, a strongly aging population, one of the, the, the strongest in, in, uh, in the world. And this is, this is in line with what has been reported previously. And so what we then did was we looked at the relative contributions. And so we looked at a lot more, um, uh, uh, sorry, excuse me, risk factors in this, but these are the ones that came out that were quite strong. And so the first thing that we saw that was really interesting to us was this increase. So 16% predictive power of tangible support. So this was the strongest effect that we saw. Um, a majority of older people in these societies don't have the tangible support that they need. Um, then we saw similar to what's been reported in other studies, social confidence was predictive as was positive social support, which is um, having someone to talk to um, and the number of social interactions. Sorry. Um, and what we found is that when we then split this up across countries, we saw that there were similar loneliness scores across countries and territories. Um, so pretty much the 79% was consistent across all of the countries, but the factors did vary a bit. And that's something that we're in the process of, of doing a secondary analysis for now. The first analysis we did, which was just published earlier this year, um, was just on the overarching, um, considering all of the data together. Um, and as we start to, to tease this apart, I think we might be able to find some interesting cultural um, effects here. So um, that's, those are the major results that we have. Um, if I talk about sort of to conclude our major findings is that in this region, loneliness is a major issue for older people. And that's even the case for people with regular social interactions. And so I think that within the loneliness community, this is, um, I don't want to say somewhat obvious, but not entirely surprising. But that being said, um, it's, it's something that when we are then talking to government officials and um, other people who are implementing either interventions or policies, so NGOs, this is something that is needs to be highlighted. The second thing that we think is a really important point that needs to continue to be reiterated with governments is that understanding the population's underlying factors is key. So if you don't have the same factors, this, the same intervention that might work well in Serbia isn't necessarily going to work in Bosnia and Herzegovina if a majority of the population has a different underlying risk factor that's explaining a lot of this. And I think that the discussion we were having towards um, towards the end of the, the large session about you know starting to get to the level of personalized versus a population, I think that's something that is is sort of an outstanding question. At what level are we really targeting these types of interventions? Because um, different people are going to have even within a population different underlying risk factors, and those need to be addressed in fundamentally different ways. Um, what we thought was really exciting is this tangible support result. And so this is an underappreciated factor for loneliness, certainly among the interventions that have been done so far. And it's also really exciting because it's something we can all help address. So the reality of the situation is that, you know, if somebody's lost their spouse, a program that does an intervention is not going to reinstate a 40 year marriage. But if somebody needs help getting their groceries, their neighbor can do that. You could have a community of volunteers doing that. There's a lot of ways that we're looking at this. Um, it, and also using the healthy aging centers to try and set up volunteerism among the older community in order to try and address this. And the, the main message that we took when we um, launched this study in January mm -hmm. is that uh -huh. small actions. Yep. Thank you. I'm just about done. Um, small actions can make a big difference. And so I think that's really the key thing is that everyone has a role in the community that they can play um in terms of helping address um, loneliness, at least to some degree in older people and improving their well being. So um, I will finish here. So this is all of the people. So we did this study in 2021 um, and obviously uh, doing surveys with older people in six different countries uh, during COVID was a challenge. And it's really through the amazing work of so many people um, that, that this was, was, uh, was achieved. And as I said, our um, initial report on the overarching data was published in January. Um, I could put this into the link, but um, you can find this on the, the UNFPA um, websites. Um, and read more into the details of the, the modeling and the, um, the work that we've done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tara. What a, another fascinating talk and in, really interesting perspectives on sort of different levels in terms of the population risk factors as well. And I think it'd be great if you could pop a link into the chat of your report. Um, as with the other talks, if everyone can pop their questions or comments into the chat too, um, Tara might be able to answer some while we're going through. Um, but for now, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who um, Andrew Summerland, who is 
talking about measurement of social connection in people living in care homes, a systematic review. I can see your slides, Andrew, thank you. And like the others, I'll give you a two minute heads up, okay? Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm Andrew Summerlad. I'm uh, uh, an old age psychiatrist and a, and a researcher at UCL. Um, and I'm going to talk today about our SONNET study, um, which is about improving the measurement of social connection in people who live in care homes. And the study is a collaboration between UCL, where I work, and University Health Network in Toronto, where Dr. Um, Jennifer Bethel is the co-lead of the study with me. And we're funded, I'm very grateful to be funded by the uh, Alzheimer's Association in the US and Brain Canada. So um, I'm going to talk first about why social connection is important for care home residents and then why so, uh, measurement of social connection in these settings is difficult and why there might be problems with how this has been done in the past. And I'll talk about the work that we've done. This is a sort of a work in progress talk, the work that we've done and that we will do in the SONNET study. We're only a few months through a two year research program. Um, and I'll talk about the overall structure of the study to illustrate how we're going to get to our planned endpoint of improving measurement of social connection. Um, and I'm really keen to hear thoughts, comments and suggestions that any of you have um, in the Q&A uh, so that we can improve the work that we're doing. Um, so first I want to explain what we mean by social connection. This is uh, shown here as our draft conceptual framework, which is central to the work that we're doing because we really want to understand what social connection is in a, in a care home setting. So we're going to build on and refine this informed by the work that we do in the study. For now, our view is that social connection refers collectively to aspects of human relationships and interactions. It's about how individuals connect to each other and comprises objective and subjective constructs which are linked, but as we've heard already today, distinct. Um, so here we have the positive objective aspects on the left. Um, social networks, engagement and support, and positive subjective experience that we describe as social connectedness. And the antitheses of these are, are being socially isolated or lonely. And we're interested in all of these concepts in our work uh, because all of them have been, you know, uh, have been considered important and studied in the past. Um, so I hope we can all agree that social connection is a, is a basic human need. And um, research has shown that poor, poor social connection is linked to adverse health outcomes, including in increased risk of mortality and elevated risk of dementia. And the devastating impact of restrictions implemented in COVID uh, pandemic have, have underscored the importance of social connection for everyone, and all the more so for people who live in care homes. So. Um, social connection is essential to long-term care home residents as it is for everyone um, and it, it's an important determinant of um, quality of life and, a, and really a marker of good quality care to be able to promote good social connection in, uh, for people who live in care homes. But there are distinct considerations for care home residents. Uh, most care home residents are older adults and they've got complex health needs like cognitive, sensory and mobility impairments. Um, they share space with people they might not have known previously and take part in activities together as well as receiving daily care from staff and care homes are often separated from uh, uh, other community activities so measures of social connection amongst people living in these settings really do have to capture these uh, these distinct characteristics and to be developed and evaluated in these settings um, but there's no consensus at the moment on the best way that we should be measuring social connection in care homes and there are potential problems with existing measures, um, as I will go on to discuss later in the talk. And this is really problematic because it means that um, we can't be confident that we're conducting high quality research um, and we want to be able to do that to try to improve the quality of social connection for people who live in care homes. So our study aims to address these three main research questions. What measures currently assess social connection in care homes and what are their psychometric properties? How accurately do they measure social connection? Uh, what do residents, family members, clinicians, care staff and researchers consider to be important for social connection in care homes? And can we develop a new measure which adequately assesses social connection amongst care home residents? 
this is the overall structure of the study and I'll talk through each of these points. Um, so we'll assess what measures assess social connection in um, care homes using a systematic review in which we are looking at previous measurements um, and I'm going to talk about this in, in, in more detail later. Uh, we want to find out what care home residents and stakeholders consider to be important for social connection by engaging these stakeholders in focus groups and qualitative interviews in Canada and the UK about what is important for social connection in care homes and how it is measured. We'll then um, ask whether we can uh, develop a new measure to assess social connection by using the, the results from AIM1 and AIM2 to, to develop our new measure. And then test whether this uh, new measure um, is, is accurate by uh, establishing its psychometric properties, its acceptability, feasibility, validity and reliability and other properties uh, in, study, in a, a larger study in the UK and in Canada. Um, so I'm now just going to focus on the systematic review. Um, so we have searched back in November several databases, uh, databases which are listed here for primary research papers uh, with no limit on language as we wanted to include measures that have been translated from English to other uh, for, for use in other settings and vice versa. Um, we, want, we wanted studies where the majority of people are care home residents so over two-third two -third care home re residents, the majority are over 65, which assess any aspect of social connection, all the things that we've uh, that I talked about earlier on in our framework. And we wanted measures which have some evidence of having been tested in the past, so we included studies which have reported at least one psychometric property of the measure. And the, the review has, has been registered, and you can access the, the um, uh, protocol for it here. So our um, initial search included terms related to social connection, terms for care homes, and this filter from um, COSMIN, which is a, a group consensus-based standards for the selection of health measurement instruments, whose you know, aim is really to try and improve uh, understanding of measurement instruments. And they have a, a, a filter that can be applied in a systematic review to look for studies in particular, which had psychometric properties. Um, and we have then subsequently conducted a second targeted search looking for studies uh, relating to several additional scales which we found in systematic reviews which may also have assessed social connection. Um, so this is our uh, prisma diagram, working prisma diagram showing that we found around 6,000 unique references and after filtering out the studies that weren't relevant we've so far got 49 studies which report on the uh, 36 unique scales. And I've listed them here, and this obviously isn't, is a difficult way to try and, uh, to, to try and um, understand the, the, the scales. Um, but here I've uh, tried to show how some of these studies cluster, and this begin to, uh, begins to illustrate the challenges and problems with some of these scales. So I've grouped them here according to their overall aim. And you can see that the largest number of scales, 10 of them, which have measured social connection in care homes, have actually been designed to assess quality of life or overall well-being. Um, some have assessed function. Some are from a range of tools which are embedded in routine data collection rather than necessarily than being research-led uh, tools. Several are in a group which are still, um, are still kind of miscellaneous and only a relatively small number primarily focus on social connection. And this is clearly potentially, sure, thanks, potentially problematic as it indicates there's insufficient focus on social connection um, and it's concerning for the quality of measurement of social connection. Our next steps are that we'll, we've extracted most of the data from these studies, but we'll complete this and finalise our list of measures. We then want to understand what the measures are really assessing. So we're going to use a framework method where we list each question or item within each measure and then code what each of these assess, linking these back to our conceptual framework. So by the end of that, we'll be able to clarify exactly what aspect of social connection the 30 or 40 measures that we, that we have assess. And this will be, I hope, helpful to future researchers who want to use these. And then we want to 
also tell other researchers what the evidence is for how accurately each measure works. So we'll use these COSMIN checklists to assess how each, well, how person-centered each measure is and how each one rates for, for each psychometric property and summarize this evidence. I thought I'd touch very briefly on our qualitative study, the other work that we're doing, which is ongoing, and we're currently interviewing care home residents and other groups in the UK and Canada, asking them what was important socially for them and how that changed uh, socially for them before they lived in a care home and how this changed afterwards. Um, what is good social connection and also their views on measurement, you know, what, what matters more subjective or objective experiences, who should we ask? And we're going to thematically analyze these and map these back to our conceptual framework. And then towards the end of uh, the year, we'll be using this framework to inform the form and content of our new measure, working with PPI as we do so. And probably next year, we'll be testing this measure in, in 150 care home residents to establish the psychometric properties. Um, so that's a, a whistle stop tour of the SONNET study and hopefully describes the work that we're doing. Um, it's a, as I've said, it's a collaboration between various um, institutions um, and Jennifer Bethel, as I've said, at, in Toronto is, is the co-lead of the study. And I want to also um, give thanks to the fantastic PPI team in Canada and in the UK linked with the Alzheimer's Society who've given us a lot of steer so far in the study and will continue to do so. And there's links there to our website and, um, and Twitter if, uh, if anyone would like to find out more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and a really fantastic presentation. And it sounds like the group will really benefit from hearing from you again later on this year and then probably next year as well with the rest of the project happening too. Yeah, thank you. So we've got um, plenty of time now for a couple of opportunities, sorry, some opportunity for questions. Um, there's been some interesting conversations happening within the chat. So I was wondering if Georgina, would you like